So the next few sections, <clears throat> we're going to talk about the assessment of the musculoskeletal system. We're going to talk about taking a history. We're also going to talk about doing a physical exam. And we're going to talk about some of the diagnostic procedures that you might see in regard to the musculoskeletal system. Musculoskeletal disorders are the leading cause of disability in the United States. They have significant impact on quality of life for people, and the lack of mobility that's involved can also impact other systems. So no matter what specialty area you're in, you can encounter patients who have problems with the muscles, bones, nerves, and joints. And you need to know how to take care of these patients. So let's move along. So this section is um, involving the nursing assessment of the musculoskeletal system. There's a lot to discuss, but hopefully we'll be able to go through it pretty quickly because it's a review of what you learned in Nursing 137. Um, you can find more information if you feel you need to review further in your Jarvis textbook and also in Chapter 40 of the Hinkle and Cheever MedSurge textbook. Um, so the components of the assessment of the musculoskeletal system start with the history. Um, and the key finding is usually going to be pain. So you want to do a thorough pain assessment. Um, and you want to ask where the location, the severity, the character, the duration, the onset, the timing, things that make it better, things that make it worse, things the patient's tried. Um, and you also want to note if there's any stiffness with the pain or any limitation of movement. Because all of those things will give you a lot of information about what might be bothering this person and what might help them. Um, for example, anyone who's ever broken a bone can probably remember that that pain feels sudden and sharp. Um, it is immediately connected to the injury that preceded it and um, it's also accompanied by swelling, deformity, um, and loss of function in the part that was broke, the bone that was broken. Whereas if you've sprained an ankle, you note that it was like a twisting movement um, that was accompanied again by sharp, sudden pain that's worse when you move it and some swelling. Um, on the other hand, things like arthritis might be sort of a generalized aching. It might be in all of the joints or it might only be in a few of them. And that pain might start out really bad in the morning and get better as the person moves around and loosens up and that would be more characteristic of rheumatic pain. Um, where, or it could be a pain that starts out as a dull aching and gets more intense as the day wears on and those joints have to absorb more um, impact. Um, muscle strain pain can be uh, very acute and intense or it can be a dull aching and it sort of depends on what you did to the muscle to um, make it hurt. So get as much information as you can about the pain. If the pain is accompanied by any loss of motion or any um, limited range of motion, you want to assess that person's ability to carry out ADLs because that's really important um, to note and to be able to help them. Okay, so along with pain, you're going to assess for any altered sensation. And the word that I want you to remember with that is called paresthesia. Um, and the reason that it's kind of important for you to remember that is that it's going to be associated with the five P's. And the five P's are going to be something we need to know later on um, for cast care and anything else that might result in neurovascular compromise. So paresthesia can feel like tingling, burning, numbness, shooting sensations, um, and all of that is important to note. We want to know if there was any injury or trauma that preceded the pain or the complaint that the person came in with. Um, and we want to get as much information as we can about that injury. Was it a fall? Was it a contact injury? Um, did that person get into a motor vehicle accident? We want to know when the injury occurred or when the trauma happened and what was there about it. Was it a blunt trauma? Um, you want to get as much information as you can about that injury. Sometimes old injuries can be problematic long after um, 
the recovery process has been completed. So make sure that you're questioning your patient about those things. We want to get any information about um, disease processes. For example, does that person have disc dysfunction um, in the vertebral discs? We want to know if that person has any history of gout or arthritis, any history of osteoporosis. And we want to note some diseases that might not seem directly related to the musculoskeletal system, but that may have impact. For example, um, does that person have cancer? Cancer can lead to bone metastasis and it can lead to um, pathological fractures. We want to know if that person has renal disease. Um, disorders of the kidney have serious impact on bone. We want to note if that person um, has thyroid disorders because the uh, Graves disease, the hyperthyroidism, um, will lead to bone loss, as will Cushing syndrome. And Cushing syndrome is an excessive release of cortisol or excessive cortisol from um, steroid treatments. So while we're talking about steroids, let's um, just kind of put our medications down here. I'm going to star that because I want you to remember it. For most of this presentation, I want you to follow your stars. And there will be a wrap-up screen where we talk about um, things that key points that are important to know. But if I put a star next to something, and you know what, in fact, I'm going to put a star next to this word here, just so you remember it for later, so you can put it into context. But when we talk about medications, um, the reason that I'm giving that a star is that there's a certain class of medications that cause serious problems in the musculoskeletal system and they are, excuse me, corticosteroids. And in this class, let's move that up a little bit. I'll actually kind of put it over here. Um, in this class are your prednisone, methylprednisolone, betamethasone, dexamethasone, that S-O-N-E, um, hydrocortisone. Uh, if a person is taking those medications, those corticosteroids, for a long term, they have effects on bone and muscle. Sometimes people take corticosteroids for disorders of the musculoskeletal system to decrease inflammation. So it's important to note if that person is on those meds and how they're responding to them. Um, other things that are important in the history, let's talk about nutrition. And you're going to get some more information on this, but please take note of the fact that certain nutrients have serious impact on the musculoskeletal system, particularly calcium, vitamin D, magnesium, and phosphorus. Okay, so calcium is the primary mineral when we are discussing bone health. It constantly comes up. It's going to be the one thing that you want to educate your patient on. Good sources of calcium include... Um, dairy products and leafy green vegetables, um, as well as like sardines with bones, I think, salmon with bones. People don't tend to eat those though. So um, mostly we're going to assess for um, either calcium fortified foods like orange juice and cereal or their dairy products and their leafy green vegetables. Adequate intake of calcium is defined as 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams a day. And I'm not cluttering my screen with this because we are going to repeat this information when we get to um, the osteoporosis content. Just keep it in the back of your mind. This is important. Um, and in order to absorb calcium, we need vitamin D. Um, vitamin D is made on our skin by sunlight. It's metabolized in the kidney um, to a form our body can use. And it helps pull calcium out of the GI tract and into... Um, circulation where it can be absorbed by the bone. Magnesium is also a component of bone and phosphorus. Phosphorus and calcium are inversely related. It's probably something you just learned in fluids and electrolytes, um, but I'm going to review that because I think it's important for you to note um, that when a person's phosphorus is very high, for example, in renal disease, their, calcium is, their serum calcium is often low. Um, so one of the ways we treat that is to give them a form of calcium that knocks that phosphorus back into balance. Um, 
not necessary for you to really memorize that right now. Just kind of think of it and tuck it away in the back of your head. While we're taking the history, you really want to note a lot of different factors in their personal, social, and family history. For one thing, it's also part of a nutritional assessment, but note the BMI and note their dietary habits. Okay, a person with an excessive BMI is at risk for back pain, um, muscle strains. They're also at risk for osteoarthritis. A person with a low BMI is at risk for osteoporosis. Um, we want to note what their occupations are. Um, are they involved in an occupation like landscaping or construction? Or are they lifting frequently? Um, are they in healthcare where they're lifting patients and assisting patients or maybe bending a lot? Do they sit at a desk where they might um, be exaggerating that lumbar spine and getting lower back pain? Um, we want to note that. Do they have hobbies that cause repetitive movements? Are they involved in sports or in certain exercises? Um, in regards to exercise, if they have contact sports, they're at injury, they're at risk for injury. If they are involved in weight-bearing activity, that actually helps to preserve bone. Um, if they're involved in uh, high-impact activities like running, jogging, um, those kind of things, that can wear on their joints. Um, repetitive hand motions can predispose somebody to carpal tunnel. So there's a lot of things you want to find out about this person. Um, if they're complaining of pain, you want to find out maybe what contributed to that. In terms of a social history, you're going to ask them um, if they smoke, if they drink alcohol, how much, and how much caffeine intake and soda intake they have. Um, smoking causes bone loss and impairs bone healing. It can also lead to impaired circulation in the extremities. Um, so if they get an ulcer, that can lead to osteomyelitis because they're not healing as well. Um, we want to know if they um, are drinking excessive alcohol because that has two effects. It robs the bone of calcium and it also it usually is associated with decreased intake of nutri nutritious foods. You want to note their caffeine intake. Caffeine is associated with bone loss as well. And a family history is important to get. Um, does the family history include um, any members with gout, with rheumatoid arthritis or autoimmune disease? Um, is there any family history of osteoporosis or osteoarthritis? Um, so history is really important and we get a lot of information by just talking to our patients. And the next obvious thing we do is to inspect. And you're doing this as you're talking to the person most likely. Um, and this is just anything we can see and we talk about posture. Um, I know we talked about posture in the lab for 137. Here I have some pictures. You've probably seen them before. Uh, let me make that a little bit bigger because then we'll sort of talk about them. Never hurts to review. Okay, so here's kyphosis again. We've seen that before. That's this exaggerated curve of the thoracic spine um, associated with age and with osteoporosis. It's also called a dowager hump. And when we see it, we usually know that there's been some loss of height. Um, from a shortening of the vertebral column. Um, here is a lumbar lordosis. This lady's nice and thin, but generally speaking, when we see a lordosis, think of those weaker abdominal muscles. We see it a lot with pregnancy. We see it with um, obesity, particularly obesity in the central area. Um, and what it is, this person is trying to balance. If their front body is bigger and heavier than their back body, um, and if their abdominal muscles are fairly weak, they're going to start to um, sort of push that back out so that they can balance themselves. And the last curvature of the spine that we're seeing here is called scoliosis. You've probably all heard of it. Um, we commonly find it first in adolescent girls, and I'm going to kind of go over this S-shaped curve here. It can be a C-shape curved, but it curves from the thoracic to the lumbar spine. Sometimes when we don't see it in the spine, we can see it. If 
by looking at the shoulder blades is one higher than the other. We can see it by looking at the hips is one higher than the other. Um, we can ask the person to sort of touch their toes, bending down. We look from behind, and what we'll see is that there's an asymmetry between the hips. One's higher than the other. One leg will look shorter than the other, even though it's not really. Um, so those are some major disturbances of posture. Next, we talk about gait. And I don't want you to get too hung up. There are lots of different types of gait. Um, you can see the gait disturbances in your Wilkinson and Treese book. Um, there are lots of videos of them on YouTube. I really debated about showing them to you on this presentation. But I don't want you to get too caught up in studying the different types of gait. Know what normal looks like and know what normal, how normal can deviate. Um, normally, a person should walk with smooth, coordinated gait, one foot in front of the other. Um, they should have a normal stride length. They shouldn't be shuffling. They shouldn't be limping. They shouldn't be swinging one leg. Um, it shouldn't look spastic. It shouldn't look like a scissor gait. Um, you know, just watch how the person walks. Um, and they should have a normal amount of balance. Um, as we get through different disorders like Parkinson's, which won't be part of this unit, um, or like stroke, um, those are more neurological disorders, CP, then we can talk about different gait disturbances. For now, just know, look at the person's gait um, and get an idea of how they're walking. Um, the biggest gait you're probably going to see with a musculoskeletal injury is in the antalgic gait. Again, don't get hung up on it. Just look for normal, and if you don't see that, note it. Now we're talking about deformity. If you see any deformities, um, and there's all different types of deformities. Let's see if I can get you some good. There's one. Okay, so something like that. Um, obviously not normal. Um, so you would want to note that. And something like that. Um, here we can look at the deformity of the hands caused by arthritis. There's an ulnar drift. It's these fingers drifting down out to the side. There's that boutonniere sign. Um, I'm not really seeing the swan neck deformity, but that's probably next, and I see some nodules. So those are kind of things that you're going to look at. You're also going to want to assess um, the range of motion. And if you note any limitations, definitely um, let the provider know, because that's um, going to tell you a lot about that person's overall function. And you're going to note the condition of the joints. And we just saw a picture of somebody whose joints look obviously deformed. You're also going to um, you know, look for any kind of redness, any nodules, any swelling, um, in addition to those more obvious deformities. Okay, and after inspection, we get to palpation. Let me make that a little bit bigger. Okay, so when you palpate over the joints and muscles, you're going to note if you feel any warmth. Um, sensation of warmth, you're going to note coolness. When you do your neurovascular checks, coolness could be a lack of circulation to the extremity, distal to the injury. Heat is usually inflammation. Look for swelling. Swelling accompanies most injuries. It also accompanies most um, inflammation processes. You're going to look for tenderness. Try not to be, um, try not to elicit too much tenderness. If you feel that somebody's having a lot of pain or resistance when you palpate, um, you can stop and just note that there was tenderness. Um, muscle strength. There were a lot of good tests of muscle strength in your Jarvis textbook, and there was a good description of how you would document your findings um, from zero to five. Um, testing muscle strength is very important, obviously. Nodules, we saw some nodules. Let's see if I can find you some more. Um, there we go. Okay, so you would palpate over here and sort of feel, are they hard, are they movable, are they along the tendon? Um, so that's an important assessment to make. Now we're going to get to crepitus. Crepitus is some, it's, Sometimes described as a grating sound, 
um, or a crunching sound. It can also be assessed as a scraping or grating sensation and what crepitus comes from, generally speaking, when we're talking about musculoskeletal disorders, is bone rubbing on bone. Um, if it's a fracture, those bone fragments are rubbing against each other. What I want you to take home for, for crepitus, okay, this is the important point and it will be repeated as we get to something a little bit more um, substantial with the content. Once you feel crepitus, or once you assess crepitus, because you might be hearing it as a crunching or grating sound, stop palpating. Do not try to keep eliciting crepitus. And I will give you a story to go with this. Um, I was working in newborn with another nurse. She went to a delivery. Um, baby had a shoulder dystocia, and um, she suspected a fracture of the clavicle. Baby wasn't moving both arms equally. So she very gently palpated and she thought she assessed crepitus. So um, rather than have confidence in her assessment and call the doctor, she asked one of the other nurses to check her finding. The other nurse came over, was not nearly as gentle, sort of had this belief that you can't break the babies, that's just not possible. And she kept assessing for crepitus and said, I don't feel anything, it feels fine. Well, the second nurse, whether it was first nurse or second nurse, I'm really not even sure, um, somebody who was palpating in that area with the clavicles um, actually punctured the lung with one of the bone fragments and the baby ended up with a pneumothorax. And that's um, something you definitely don't wanna do. You can take an open fracture, I mean a closed fracture, and turn it into an open fracture um, by continually trying to elicit that crepitus. So that really is a pretty good summary of the assessment of um, the musculoskeletal system. Again, it's not meant to be a thorough, in-depth analysis. Um, it is a review of what you learn in Nursing 137. Oh, wait. Okay, so we're ready to talk about the diagnostic evaluation for the musculoskeletal system. Um, the mainstay of diagnostic studies are the imaging studies. And mostly when we talk about looking at bones and joints and muscles, we look at x-rays. Uh, CT scans and MRIs give us even more detailed information. Uh, x-rays allow us to look at bone density to some extent, um, although you might not see changes associated with osteoporosis on an x-ray. You're going to see things about bone texture, bone integrity, a fracture will show up on an x-ray. Um, you'll see erosion of the bones or joints and you'll see changes in bone relationships. Um, they tell us a lot about um, the structures surrounding the bones also, um, particularly the joint capsules and we can take special x-rays for different purposes. Often we need the patient to be very still while we look at um, serial x-ray. We take serial pictures. You can have anteroposterior pictures, lateral views, but you're going to be looking at that um, affected part from different angles. Um, it's important for that patient not to wear any jewelry or zippers or anything that could interfere with the imaging. Um, a CT scan is computed tomography, and we can do that with or without contrast medium. It gives us a very detailed picture, and I'm going to show you what one of those might look like. And here's one here. I'm going to just, I'll shrink it down a little bit. Um, but you can see that that picture is much, much more detailed than your standard um, 2D x-ray. Um, it involves taking a lot of different pictures from different angles. Um, and we can see tumors we can uh, look at injury to soft tissue, ligaments, tendons. Um, if there's trauma, we can see um, things that we might not be able to see on an x-ray, such as um, bleeding in the soft tissues. So that's your CT scan. An MRI uses a very large magnet. Um, with non it's a non-invasive test. However, people get very claustrophobic in the scanner um, and they will hear knocking and pinging, so they should be made aware of that. 
they cannot bring anything metal in with them. Um, so bobby pins, jewelry, credit cards with a metallic strip, um, patches like a scopolamine patch or a nicotine patch that has a thin layer of metal. Um, these can cause severe damage to the patient's skin. Hearing aids, cochlear implants um, should not come in with them. And um, they should notify their provider if they have any kind of implanted metal, whether that's a, like a prosthetic joint, um, any pins or rods or anything like that that might um, damage them. People can't bring in keys, uh, police badges, um, the code cart can't even really come near the magnet. The magnet can never be turned off. And interestingly enough, if a patient has ever been exposed to any kind of fragments like shrapnel, um, I had a friend who worked in a foundry once and the workers were always getting um, little fragments of metal in their eyes. These folks cannot go into a standard MRI. There are open MRIs, just so you know, um, and they kind of help with that claustrophobic feeling, but you have to go to a special center for them. And I'm going to show you a picture of an MRI just so you see what kind of things we can see on the MRI. And there it is. Okay. And if you look, you see very, very detailed pictures. And again, we can look not just at bone, but at soft tissue. And that's one of the main advantages. The MRI gives us a lot of really good information. So another example of um, an imaging study that we can use is a DEXA scan or bone density scan. There are actually, sorry, several different types of bone density scans, but the DEXA scan is the one that we um, generally use because it takes pictures of the hip and spine um, and gives a pretty good predictive value for fractures. Um, it's really good at picking up osteopenia, which is a precursor to osteoporosis, and um, also for diagnosing osteoporosis. The results are reported as T-scores, and T-scores compare the health, it's compare the patient's bone to the bone of a patient who is young, healthy, and has maximum bone density. So anything from anything that is within one standard deviation of that normal bone is considered a normal x-ray. If you have a bone density that ranges from negative 1.0 um, or bone density that's less than one standard deviation of normal to negative 2.5, you have osteopenia, which is um, a decreased bone density. If you have more than, like if you have a negative 2.5 or less, um, that gives you a diagnosis of osteoporosis. So that's a DEXA scan. Again, it's a non-invasive test. It takes about 15 minutes. Um, they aren't closed in like they are with an MRI. But people should know not to bring metal jewelry, zippers. They should have loose, comfortable clothing. They may even be asked to wear a gown. And they may be asked to go without calcium supplements for 48 hours. Arthrography, um, or an arthrogram, is x-ray imaging of a joint. And normally, um, what happens is that a contrast dye, a medium, is injected into the joint. And let me see what I have as far as what that might look like. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so that's a, a result from an arthrogram. And you can see this is the hip joint. Let me highlight all of this cloudy stuff. That's that contrast medium kind of floating out of the synovial capsule. And that's clearly an abnormal result. Um, but we do this when, we ha when there's some sort of joint disorder that needs evaluation. One consideration for any of the studies that require any kind of contrast medium, you want to make sure that that person is not allergic to shellfish or iodine um, because the contrast medium is based on uh, iodine products. In addition to the imaging studies, we have, <clears throat> excuse me, 
a few other um, ways to check on structures of the musculoskeletal system, and one of them is a biopsy. And we do this when we suspect some sort of cell or tissue um, abnormality. You can biopsy bone, you can biopsy muscle, um, and you can biopsy bone uh, synovio, synovial fluid, um, or synovial tissue to sort of diagnose certain diseases. Um, you have to reassure your patient that they're going to get some pain medicine for this because it can be a painful procedure. It involves um, taking a small amount of tissue and analyzing that tissue under a microscope um, to see if there are abnormal uh, abnormalities or changes at the tissue level. Um, after the biopsy, the post-op care, you're going to give that person ice and you're going to monitor the site for any bleeding, in fact, signs and symptoms of infection, um, hematoma formation, and you're going to medicate that person for pain. So another test that we can do is called arthroscopy. And arthroscopy is the insertion of um, an endoscope into the joint. So normally this happens in the operating room under sterile conditions. Um, the person is given some anesthetic. Um, and then a large bore needle is inserted into the joint. And the whole joint is sort of injected with saline. Um, and then a flexible endoscope is used to view all the structures of the joint. Um, the person can be in quite a bit of pain afterwards. Generally, uh, after the procedure is done, a sterile dressing is applied. You apply ice for 24 to 48 hours. And um, you might use like a compression dressing, like an ACE bandage, um, to put some pressure on that. You also might extend and elevate the extremity. Um, if it's a knee, you're going to put the knee up on some pillows, and you're going to tell the person to rest. Um, but this is sometimes important when somebody's got a lot of joint disease. Arthrocentesis is needle aspiration of fluid from the joint. And um, this is, you know, generally when people have a lot of fluid on the joint, an effusion, um, an ACL injury, um, or if we want to examine the synovial fluid, um, under local anesthetic, they aspirate some fluid from that joint. Sometimes they aspirate quite a bit of fluid from that joint. Um, and then the post care is usually, uh, again, the compression dressing and the ice and monitoring the site for bleeding or signs of infection. So electromyography or an EMG um, is a procedure where we study the um, nerve impulses um, going through the muscle. And it's kind of actually a painful procedure. I've actually had this done. And what they do is they insert these little needle electrodes at various points throughout the muscle, and they run some current through um, and see the speed of that nerve transmission. Um, considerations for this test. You want to prepare your patient. Let them know. It's mildly uncomfortable. It isn't excruciatingly painful, but it does feel shocky and kind of weird um, and can sometimes give people some muscle spasms. So you do want to prepare them for that. Um, the other consideration, you want to look and make sure that their skin um, doesn't have any major rashes or um, lesions. And you want to tell that person, don't use any skin lotion or cream um, on the day of the procedure. Um, but this is something you might do if you suspect some kind of uh, cervical spine injury or any kind of uh, nerve injury that affects the muscle. And in terms of laboratory evaluation, there aren't that many studies, and I'm going to cover them on the next um, piece of this. But just know that there are certain studies that indicate muscle damage um, and certain studies that might indicate uh, certain bone abnormalities or bone pathologies like Paget's disease of the bone or um, when you see bone metastasis. Um, we do some laboratory evaluation mostly though we, we rely on the imaging studies and um, to a lesser extent on procedures like a biopsy or arthroscopy. So there are some laboratory studies that can indicate bone health or uh, musculoskeletal health. I'm going to start with the ones that are bone markers. Let's see, serum calcium. Calcium is actually not the best marker for um, bone disease because although 97 and 98% of the body's bone, our body's calcium is found in bone, 
the body will rob bone to keep serum levels adequate. Um, without adequate serum calcium, you guys learned in fluid and electrolytes, um, there are cardiac issues, there are uh, musculoskeletal issues, um, the muscles go into tetany. Um, so the body doesn't want that to happen and it will rob the bones. It's like a bank robber. Um, PTH will stimulate that release of calcium from the bone into the blood. Um, so somebody can have osteoporosis or osteopenia um, for quite a long time and still their serum calcium is normal. You can see elevated serum calcium sometimes with bone disease, however. Um, for example, metastatic cancers of the bone, um, Paget's disease, and um, sometimes when we're healing from a bone fracture, you will see elevated serum calcium. Serum phosphorus is inversely relational to serum calcium. Um, and sometimes we do see this, again, abnormally. Most of the time when you see an elevated phosphorus level, it's really coming from the kidneys. Um, but every once in a while, you will see it associated with conditions like um, bone fractures, bone tumors, and acromegaly. Acromegaly is that accelerated growth. Um, if you ever saw The Princess Bride, Andre the Giant, one of my uh, favorite movies, he had acromegaly, and there was an excessive growth of the bone. Um, hypophosphatemia can be associated with osteomalacia. That's a condition we're going to talk about in our third lecture for this series. Um, so that's something you might see serum phosphorus used for. And I don't want you guys to memorize all of this, just have a good foundational understanding um, of how these factors affect um, the musculoskeletal system. Alkaline phosphatase. Let's see, let me move that out of the way and get that down here. Okay, alkaline phosphatase is an enzyme. Um, it can be released by the osteoblast cells. So anytime we're growing bone or repairing bone, we see elevated levels of alkaline phosphatase. So you'll see it, for example, in a bone fracture. You may see it in the, you always see it in the last trimester of pregnancy when the mom is growing bone for the fetus or, you know, making factors that help the fetus grow bone. But you'll also see it in abnormal conditions of the bone, like metastatic cancer, um, bone mets, Paget's disease of the bone, which we'll cover later, and osteomalacia. And those are all conditions we'll talk about later. So it's good that you know that um, these factors are involved. Now also we look at these factors, the calcitonin, PTH, and vitamin D. These are all metabolic um, components that are indicators of metabolic bone status. Calcitonin is a hormone um, that stimulates bone formation. PTH does the opposite. So these two hormones kind of interplay with one another. Um, PTH stimulates bone resorption. So if the serum calcium is low, the parathyroid will kick out PTH, parathyroid hormone, and rob the bone a little bit, like that bank robber, to keep the serum levels normal. Calcitonin puts calcium in the, in the bone bank. Um, so we have those two factors that sort of oppose each other and keep things in balance. We also have vitamin D, and vitamin D makes calcium available um, by helping the absorption of it from the gastrointestinal tract. So you might see these ordered when you suspect bone disorders, um, especially the endocrine variety, like hyperparathyroidism or thyroid disorders. Um, or you might see vitamin D studies ordered commonly for people considered at risk, elderly people, um, people who have nutritional deficiencies. And anytime you suspect osteoporosis, you wanna see um, where the vitamin D levels are because if the calcium is not being made available to the bones, um, then you're going to have bone loss. Okay, and then we have thyroid studies and urine calcium, and those are good at detecting certain um, hormone or endocrine disorders that affect bone. But they're not really commonly done for bone disorders unless there's a problem already suspected. Now, these um, serum markers, the Creatin, creatine kinase and your aspartate aminotransferase are indicators of muscle damage. 
So the CKMM is for muscle injury. Now you can have a creatinine kinase that is cardiac specific, um, and that tells you that heart muscle is affected. Um, but when we see elevations in this um, enzyme, we know that there's muscle trauma. Um, it can be found after you have an EMG, that electromyogram, because microscopic damage um, you know, causes that release. Um, not that that's a pathological thing, it's just a side effect of having that test. Um, you also see elevations in CKMM or CK3 if you have muscular dystrophy. Um, the aspartate aminotransferase, or AST, is also found in the liver, um, but when we see elevations in it, if it's not a liver issue, it could be skeletal muscle trauma, um, somebody who's had a strain or a sprain, somebody who's overtrained a little bit, or um, progressive muscular dystrophy. When normally when we see elevations in AST, um, we're looking at liver damage. Um, so those are some laboratory studies that we might see in conjunction with the musculoskeletal system.